Welcome. On behalf of the Brookfield Chamber, I'm Marie Mazeski. I'm the chair of the Brookfield Chamber. And welcome to the 107th District State Representative Debate tonight. I'd like to thank Scott Benjamin for our, being the moderator tonight again, and to our candidates, Steve Harding and Carrie Colombo. Looking forward to a spirited debate. Let the, let the show begin. Our format. Opening statements, five minutes. Round of questions, two minutes for a response, one minute for rebuttal. Closing statements, three minutes. Ms. Colombo has five minutes for the first opening statement. Thank you. I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for arranging this and Mr. Harding for participating. Of and of course, all of those who are watching and engaged in this democratic process. I'm Carrie Colombo. I'm the Democratic candidate for state representative in the 107th district for Brookfield, Bethel, and Danbury. I'm the mom of two daughters. I have a high schooler and a middle schooler, and I've been the partner to my husband um, for 30 years now. I run my own small business for the last 15 years as a professional organizer, helping people organize their belongings in their home, all the while working in the community as well, and raising a family and doing plenty of volunteering. I'm really passionate about the volunteer and other work that I do. I have um, been addressing food insecurity and really rescued more than two million pounds of food over a two-year period, along with a team of folks and feeding 450 families on a weekly basis in the area, all the while protecting the environment from harmful methane gases that are otherwise emitted from food waste in landfills. I've traveled to Washington, D.C. the last number of years with Newtown Action Alliance and met with legislators and victims of gun violence to hear their stories. And we've talked with legislators and fought for gun laws that will keep us safer. Since 2012, I've traveled on an annual basis to the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Reservation in La Plante, South Dakota, where I have helped to address the needs of the Lakota people suffering in poverty, isolation, and lack of opportunity. I've marched. I've marched in Albany, Brookfield, Danbury, Hartford, Newtown, and Washington. I'm an activist against gun violence, for racial justice, LGBTQ plus rights, immigration reform, protecting women's reproductive choices, and safeguarding the environment. I've organized postcard writing campaigns and made phone calls to our legislators and our police to call them to action. I've listened as people have shared their stories and their worries. I'm always trying to figure out ways to help people and to create a more equitable and just world. While I respect Representative Harding, our life experiences have framed a very different approach to the world and to legislation. I believe that we're all connected and that when Connecticut thrives, we all reap the rewards. I believe that everyone deserves access to health care and medicine that they need. I will fight to create access to affordable health care that isn't tied to a job and to protect people who have pre-existing conditions and to fight again to lower the cost of prescriptions that are so exorbitantly high. I believe that good education should be available to all of the children in Connecticut and that it leads to a socially and economically thriving state and community. I also know that our high school graduates need to have options. They need continuing education options and college options and technical schools available to them so that every student can have a great career without leaving the school community with mountains upon mountains of debt. I know that we have to ease the tax burden on lower and middle income earners who are all feeling it so hard. We need fiscal discipline to ensure that relief is reaching those who need it most and to ensure that corporations and that the uber wealthy are paying their fair share proportional to their income. I also know that we need to improve and to protect our environment for future generations with renewable energy and job opportunities. I know that we need to balance factual, emotional, social, financial, and health considerations as we make all these difficult decisions. I'm open to new knowledge, and I love productive conversation and new ideas. 
I appreciate hearing the concerns that people share with me, and I intend to advocate for our residents, as I always have. When I'm state representative, I look forward to bringing our effective solutions to Hartford for a positive change on the legislative level. Thank you. Mr. Harding, five minutes. Well, th thank you very much, Scott, and I want to uh, first thank Kerry um, for uh, attending this evening and for all for her hard work during her campaign. And I have immense respect for your work and what you do, Kerry. So thank you. Um, I want to thank Scott, as I said, for always doing a great job monitoring our debates. The Chamber of Commerce, to Rich, and to Linda, uh, to Marie, um, to to uh, Steve for allowing us the opportunity to have town hall here this evening. This is really a great opportunity, uh, as Kerry mentioned, to. Uh, discuss the issues to have residents hear from us directly uh, regarding uh, what their concerns are and, and how we're going to address their concerns up in Hartford. So a little bit about who I am. For those who don't know, my name is Steve Harding. I have been uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to be the state representative of this district uh, for the past five years. I was elected in February of 2015 at the ripe old age of 27 years old. And uh, during that period of time, uh, my life has changed uh, quite significantly. Um, I am married to my beautiful wife, Kelly. She is a fifth grade teacher at Johnson School in Bethel, and I probably am not inspired by anyone more in life than her. Uh, she is an amazing life partner, and she's an amazing teacher to the students, an amazing mother as well. Uh, we have a two-year-old son, Carter, and uh, we have a daughter on the way, expected in the beginning of December. Uh, Kelly and I are very excited. Um, the grandparents are very excited. Carter is warming up to the idea. And, uh, but we were very confident he's going to be a great big brother, so we're very excited for him as well. What I love so much about uh, my job, uh, in this job as state representative, is that uh, it, it's not Washington, D.C., um, and uh, it's not national politics. We have an opportunity to have a part-time legislature here in Hartford. Um, and what that allows us to do is get to know our constituents on a more personal basis. Um, we're in the community, I'm in the community nearly 24-7. Uh, in Brookfield, Bethel, and in Danbury. And what that allows us to do is speak firsthand to the constituents about what their concerns may be, the challenges they face in their daily lives. So we hear from them directly, and I hear from them directly, whether it be contacting me on my cell phone on important issues, or on my email on important issues, or even seeing them at a church, seeing them on the Greenway, seeing them at ShopRite on a Sunday morning, uh, getting, getting grocery, groceries with everybody else. I have an opportunity here directly from the constituents, and it's really an amazing opportunity to hear directly from them their concerns. And I also understand those concerns firsthand as well. Uh, as a father of a growing family, as a homeowner here in Brookfield, and as a solo practicing attorney uh, in the greater Danbury area, I, I can understand firsthand the challenges that we face each and every single day. And those challenges have, uh, have put me into a place to, to really fight for, for critical issues for this community and for other individuals throughout the state. Uh, in regards to veterans, uh, I've worked to pass legislation that would uh, allow veterans that suffer from PTSD to get the benefits they need. Uh, I've worked for legislation to help victims of crime by uh, expanding the statute of limitation on sex assault crimes. Uh, I've worked to help seniors. Uh, by uh, putting in a, uh, a provision in, in budgets that eliminate the tax on Social Securities and pension in regards to state taxes on those areas. I've worked towards financial responsibility in Hartford by passing back-to-back -back, uh, bipartisan budgets, which put in real bond caps and real spending caps that I think will help future generations afford to live here and alleviate the tax burden on future generations as we move forward. I've also worked to fight for our local education. Despite efforts by uh, some in the legislature and by multiple governors to completely eliminate funding to towns like Brookfield and Bethel, I've helped with town officials to secure millions of dollars in ECS funding back to our communities and secure over $40 million in school construction funding for the new Johnson School and Rockwell School in Bethel, as well as the new elementary school that I'm very excited is being built in a couple of years right here in Brookfield. In addition to that, also on a local level, I've worked uh, very diligently regarding our lakes, some of the most critical resources in our community, and protecting their environmental health. I have worked with legislators across the aisle to create legislation that would provide a direct funding source in regards to combating invasive species, zebra mussels, and different seaweed that's growing in our lakes that we need to address. On top of that, there's even more issues we need to address. 
and there's we need to have a state representative that will fight for this district i will always fight for this district and i would like the opportunity to continue representing you for the next two years thank you first question ct news junkie has reported this week there has been an increase recently in c covid 19 infections here in connecticut what steps does it take does the state need to take mr harding two minutes well i think that the state has taken some critical steps to address this issue i think uh, the governor has done a good job in, in, in addressing uh, and curbing the amount of infection increases that we've seen. Um, and I think what we need to do going forward, both on an economic level and on a level to protect the health of, of our state and the nation across the board, is work with our public health professionals, uh, work with the Department of Public Health, work with our health commissioners that we have uh, independently throughout the state in our, in our communities and our municipalities, and ensuring that regulation is implemented and enforced uh, to ensure that we properly social distance and we keep health uh, to, of the individuals at the forefront of our minds. And at the same time, I also think we need to start looking in the direction of uh, the governor's plan to, to phase reopening our state. Um, a lot of businesses um, are really struggling right now, and uh, being a very much consumer-based nation, um, these, these businesses, if they're not allowed to reopen in an orderly fashion, uh, are unfortunately going to have to shut their doors long term. We saw it, with, unfortunately, with O'Neill's right in downtown Bethel recently. So uh, I, I think that we need to take a two-pronged hybrid approach here. I think we need to work with our health professionals to ensure regulations are in place to stop the curb, but at the same time work to work with businesses and allow reopening plans with regulations involved to protect the health uh, to also allow the businesses to reopen in the state. And I'll conclude by saying that I think it's very important that we keep in mind up in the legislature that these small businesses and these residents that operate these small businesses and work at these small businesses can least afford tax increases and fee increases at this time and non-COVID related regulation implementation. So I think we need to be cognizant of all these things as we re reopen our state to allow our economy to grow. Ms. Colombo, two minutes. Yes, I believe we do. Um, we have done a good job here in Connecticut, and that's thanks to our governor because we have witnessed such federal negligence, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm very glad that we have Governor Lamont and his team in place. I do feel that we should um, implement a state level pandemic preparedness task force, however, um, to prepare us for future possible outbreaks, um, perhaps future pandemics. And we need to have a panel of scientists here in our state. When the federal government is, going, is not going to protect us, we need to be really proactive at the state level. So we need a panel of experts that include scientists and health professionals, epidemiologists, educators, economists, on, who can advise on how to safely open our different sectors of the economy. Because as Representative Harding mentioned, um, you know, we, we are a service-based economy and we need to help um, to address those issues in our small businesses in particular. Of course, we need to keep following the health guidelines. We need to wear our masks, socially distance. We need to increase our testing availability and our contact tracing and continue to watch the positivity rates and uh, be on top of that. We need to create access for the people who have lost their jobs. Um, people are really struggling right now. We need to uh, extend the unemployment benefits and we need to get more um, financial assistance from the federal government to help ensure that people have those safety nets that are so important to our community. And we do need to look at our economic outlook but we need to do it in a smart way. We need to make sure that we're following our health guidelines and continuing on the path that we have been on. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. I, there's not much I, I agree with what, much of what uh, Ms. Colombo has said. Um, you know, the one thing that you know, Ms. Colombo mentioned, and, and she's right, is in the unemployment benefits. And I think that one thing we also need to look, back, look at in regard is revisiting you know, how the Department of Labor operates. I think a lot of individuals have had significant struggles trying to secure those benefits um, and, and did not get much of a response from the Department of Labor. And I think that we need to take another look at how the Department of Labor operates, specifically with direct uh, contact with the uh, individuals in the state who are looking for the benefits they frankly deserve. Um, and so I think this would be a good time to uh, revisit how Department of Labor is, is currently operating and find more efficient ways to ensure that residents are gonna get the benefits they, they, they need and deserve. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. 
And to that end, I do agree, the, so we need to streamline our website management um, throughout our government here, and we need to do a better job with communication, both with unemployment benefits as well as health benefits, to ensure that people are getting the help that they need and that they don't have to um, wonder whether or not they have health care and wonder whether or not they're going to receive unemployment benefits that they need to pay their bills. Next question, what should the state do to address the budget shortfall that's been connected to the pandemic? Ms. Colombo, two minutes. So uh, we are very, very fortunate that our governor and his team were proactive in protecting the rainy day fund that unfortunately the Republicans wanted to raid in order to pay for everyday costs such as infrastructure. Um, not too long ago. So we're very fortunate that the governor protected that rainy day fund because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have the safety net that we currently have to help with addressing COVID relief issues. So um, I, I applaud him for that and I applaud our treasurer who has invested wisely. And actually we have seen something of a budget surplus as a result. So we're very fortunate to be in this position because we're in a much better position than many states are at this time. Mr. Harding, two minutes. Well, I mean, the, the first thing I'll say is the rainy day fund was created because a, a Republican budget passed unexpectedly. And uh, the, there was a bipartisan budget that was subsequently uh, passed after that Republican budget passed unexpectedly. And in that uh, Republican budget and the bipartisan budget that passed uh, a couple of years ago, there was significant constraints in regards to how we spent the additional revenue we received from Wall Street speculation and capital gains taxes. So the reason why we see such an increase in the rainy day fund right now is because of the provisions that were put in place in back-to-back -back bipartisan budgets, which I was proud to support. And that's the reason why we see such a large rainy day fund, which I think is fantastic. I think it's one of the uh, healthiest rainy day funds in, in, in the United States of America. With that being said, though, um, we face a, f uh, a deficit of about $2.5 billion this fiscal year that we're in right now. And then we face a deficit of another $3.5 billion the next fiscal year. So overall, it's a five and a half billion dollar deficit over the next two years. There's only three billion dollars in the rainy day fund. So that means that we have to make up for two and a half billion dollars. And the one thing that I will say is that I, I do not support taxing our way out of this problem. We have tried this time and time again in the state of Connecticut over the past 30 years and it has never, ever worked. Residents and businesses have moved out of the state in droves because of these tax increases. And frankly, we need to look at within ourselves as a government and find the efficiencies we need within our bureaucracy to not place a further tax burden on the people and the residents of the state, particularly at this time when many businesses and individuals are getting back to work finally after the COVID pandemic. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. Our low and moderate income families have seen an unnecessary burden on their taxes. And the fact is that we have a history of um, providing loopholes to the super wealthy and, and not um, asking them to pay their fair share and the large corporations to pay their fair share. And to say that the super wealthy are, um, are leaving in droves, it's really not. We're seeing um, folks who are middle income that are being taxed out. And that is just unfair to those who are in the working families division of our communities. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. I, I, I agree that the uh, that all there's, we should not be looking at tax increases across the board. There, there certainly should not be tax increases. If not, there should be tax decreases to individuals in the lower and middle uh, middle class in our state. But at the same time, I don't think it's beneficial for anybody in all classes to be implementing further tax increases, of which would be two and a half billion dollars in tax increases upon the state in order to make up for this deficit if we used every penny of the rainy day fund. So uh, th that I think would be terrible fiscal policy and economic policy for our state and would drive us even further and further away from where we need to be coming out of this pandemic. Mr. Harding has the next question. We'll start with him. What are your thoughts as far as the municipalities taking on part of the teacher pension costs? Two minutes. It's a terrible idea. Uh, all it's gonna do is, is drive up uh, property taxes because uh, the towns are going to ha still have to pay for the contractual obligations they have within our education, their educational budgets. And now placing this burden upon the town is completely unreasonable. This is something that the state took on this obligation uh, 75 plus years ago 
Um, and frankly, we haven't hel held up our end of the bargain. We, we need to find efficiencies within our government to pay for the debts that we have. And I think part of that also starts with being mindful of the fact that uh, we really can't contract into future obligations uh, that are going to burden uh, future generations here in the state of Connecticut with pension obligations that si we simply can't afford as a state. So I think we need to be mindful of the fact that every time we enter into collectively bargain agreements, uh, that it's going to impact generations to come here in the state of Connecticut. It's going to impact the economy and ge for generations to come here in the state. Uh, and so we need to be more fiscally prudent in the collectively bargain agreements that we're crafting and signing with our collectively bargain units. And we need to utilize those efficiencies to take on the obligations that we've promised the municipalities. It is completely wrong for us to shed ourselves of an obligation that we made 75 plus years ago here in the state and simply put it upon the municipalities who will then simply be forced to increase property taxes upon the residents. It's not fair. Our state government needs to take on this responsibility. Ms. Columbus, two minutes. We do have an obligation to continue to pay our teacher and state employee pension liabilities. And again, our governor and his team have done a really good job investing. And as a result, our treasurer has a 15% surplus as a result, which we're now able to contribute toward that state em employee's retirement fund. Unfortunately, it, um, although Republicans do often claim to be the party, party of fiscal responsibility, that um, original uh, pension burden started under Republican leadership. And what we might term in layman's terms as a, a crippling balloon payment, which is now coming due. And that is being um, changed so that we are not going to be in that kind of a position going forward so that we are paying down our pension liabilities and ensuring that folks like our teachers are getting the pensions that they've invested in and deserve. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. So, so I'm, I'm not, you know, um, concerned about what party is to blame for what happened, you know, 25, 30 plus years ago. What I'm concerned about is, is, is resolving the problem that we have and we face right now for the people of this district. And uh, so really what it comes down to is it, that's great that we have a, re, a good return on our investment. And I thank the treasurer for his hard work in making that possible and the governor's office in making that possible. But even that 50% return on the investment is not enough to continue to uh, you know, pay these obligations. We're going to have to find more ways to continue to fund this. And, and we should find more ways. We have to find more ways. It's our obligation to do it. Uh, but I think that starts with future collectively bargained agreements, which we've seen passed even just recently, uh, obligating ourselves to contractual increases, obligating ourselves to future Pentagon obligations that, frankly, as a, as a state, we can't afford. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. This is definitely something that our state needs to address and not kick back to our municipalities because it is the state that made the deal. The state needs to, to pay the debt. So it should not fall as a financial burden on our property owners here in our local communities. It should definitely be um, that, that liability should be taken care of by the state. Scott Benjamin, moderator for the Brookfield Chamber of Commerce debate. 107th District, we have the two candidates, Steve Harding and Kerry Colombo. Our fourth question, should the state try to take efforts to lower prescription drug costs? Ms. Colombo, two minutes. Absolutely. Um, folks are in such a predicament right now. They are having to choose between taking the medicine that they need and, um, and eating. People are making their pres cutting their prescriptions in half so that they can just try to get by. And that is, it's criminal. It's really criminal. So I believe that we need to look into other sources for our prescription medications. Um, we need to come to a deal so that we can, if we need to, um, bring our medications in from Canada and make sure that they, the efficacy is such that are up to our standards here in the United States and allow prescriptions, prescription medications to be affordable to our residents so that people get the medicine that they need. Mr. Harding, two minutes. So, uh, you know, Ms. Columbus is 100% right. We, we, we do need to do something about this. And so, um, uh, medications and prescriptions are, are, are too costly for the residents of this, of this state, and frankly, across the country for that matter. Mm -hmm. And we need to do more. Um, this, I was proud to support legislation just this past special session, which capped insulin. That's, a, that's one thing. It, it, it's only one prescription. I think we need to address a plethora of more. But it's, at least it's one thing that we did address. It capped the insulin uh, prescriptions at $25 per month, which is critically helpful to, to many patients. My mother has been a type 1 diabetic um, ever since I was born. So I, I've seen uh, how, how costly insulin is, is just for her and, and many other families as well. 
Uh, the House did pass, and I was proud to support legislation that, that set benchmarks to, to monitor health care costs. I think, you know, that's a lot of the problem in itself is the amount that hospitals and other medical uh, facilities are charging individuals, and I think that we need to benchmark some of these health care costs and at least monitor them and have a discussion about how to bring down those costs at that level. Uh, in addition to that, the, the legislation also addressed the issue regarding importing certain prescriptions from Canada, which, which, which Ms. Colombo did mention, um, which I think uh, if done in a, in, a, in a proper fashion and ensuring that the medicine that we have uh, is proper and up to our standards can save a lot of money in prescription costs for many individuals throughout the state. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. This really needs to be a priority for us. Um, again, you know, I really feel for all the folks that I've talked with who are struggling to pay for their medicines. I heard from a gentleman recently, his prescriptions um, due to a medical diagnosis are $10,000 a month. I mean, who can afford to pay that? No one can. So this is, this really, our health care in general, as well as prescriptions, has to be a top priority in, in this coming year. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. I, I think we're on the same page on this issue. I think this is something that has to be a priority. Fifth a question. question. What would you do to improve economic development in the district? Ms. Colombo, two minutes. Well, we need to continue and finish up our Four Corners area. Um, we have, you know, right now we've got a fenced in area and we've got some construction underway so that we need to further develop that area and, and make that nice downtown that, um, that we have envisioned and, uh, and ensure that we have businesses in place that people are going to be able to frequent and, um, and create a vibrant community, which is all what, you know, what we all really desire. Mr. Harding, two minutes. So I think that there's, there's two aspects of this. I think there's a macro aspect of this where I think that as we talked about before, we have to be ever present and ever mindful of, of, of the burden that we place on, on, on businesses. And uh, whether it's here in Brookfield or whether it's anywhere in the state of Connecticut, any business that's facing uh, fee increases, further you know, non-COVID related regulations that may be burdensome um, and uh, tax increases, uh, it's, it's going to burden a business and it's gonna uh, quench uh, the economic growth that we wanna see. Uh, so that's that's the macro level. It's a statewide level. In regards to the the town level or the you know the Brookfield Bethel Dam 107th district level, um, we need we need to continue to secure state resources in regards to developing these projects that Ms. Colombo just mentioned. So there's still that more more that needs to be done in regards to projects on the northern end of Federal Road, which would be the Four Corners area, as well as the southern end of Federal Road which Ms. Wagner knows well, in regards to getting that, that green arrow light that needs to be implemented and should be implemented this year, uh, pulling into Chick-fil-A and pulling into uh, Savings Bank of Danbury there. I mean, these, these are little, seem like little measures from a, from a 35,000 foot perspective, but when it really comes down to it, it's, the, it's those projects that really help economic growth. I can't tell you how many folks I run into, and Linda can say the same, that will tell you they, they will not pull into Chick-fil-A or they will not pull into the bank on a Saturday afternoon because of the traffic and how dangerous it is to make a left-hand turn there. So think about how, more, how many more of those customers are going to be pulling in simply because a green arrow light is put there. So we need to continue to work with the town officials and secure the resources to ensure that the state projects move forward to help economic development. And at the same time, from a macro level, we need to really make sure that we continue to monitor the tax burden placed upon these small businesses. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. I do want to be very clear that when we talk about um, you know, any type of a tax increase, I'm not talking about the mom and pop businesses who, again, are overburdened as it is and have um, felt the effects of the pandemic um, <clears throat> you know, more than many. Um, what we're talking about is ensuring that large corporations are paying their fair share when they're, when they're seeing record profits and we see individuals in individual homes who are suffering and struggling to get by. Um, that's what we're talking about when we want to address those interests on the more local level. What is your position on highway tolls? Ms. Colombo, two minutes. Yeah, I, I believe that we should very much consider highway tolls on I-95. We are talking about a through corridor that um, out-of-state drivers are using on a regular basis to travel between um, states, going from New York to Massachusetts. And the fact is that if we travel to Pennsylvania or Jersey or Massachusetts, we are paying tolls and we're supporting the roads there. And 
why in the world would we not ask other out-of-state drivers to contribute to our roadways that they're using and help to build our infrastructure, which is crumbling, and ensure that those bridges, we don't have to say a prayer every time we cross a bridge. So why, why wouldn't we take the smart fiscal step to, um, to receive 40% of that income from out-of-state out drivers rather than putting 100% of the burden of our infrastructure that out-of-state drivers are using on Connecticut residents hidden in our regular taxes? Mr. Harding, two minutes. And, 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 and uh, Ms. Coleman makes a very good point. The one thing I will say is that, you know, th that means that 60 percent uh, will be coming. Uh, this is an extra bill that will be coming out of the pockets of an over, already overburdened population um, in, in the greater Danbury area, but also statewide as well. Um, tolls is an extremely regressive tax. Uh, individuals that have the resources and the availability and the flexibility to uh, get around not paying them or not paying at higher rates during commuter times can do that. The individuals that they do not have the resources, unfortunately, to be able to get around it are now forced to pay increased rates at certain times. So 60 per, it's 60 percent of the population will be, well, the entire population will be paying a bill uh, that they previously did not have. And I think this comes back to responsibility and what we just talked about with the, the, the pensions and being paid by the state. You know, we had an obligation as a state to pay these transportation resources. We have to continue to pay them. And instead, what we've done is continue to raid the transportation fund for hundreds of millions of dollars over, for decades now. And now we're turning to the people of the state of Connecticut and saying, pay our way out of this. That's just not fair. And I think, you know, we also just talked about small businesses. Um, this would be crippling to greater Danbury area small businesses. And I, I know, it would, yes, I would, I, I, you know, if it was only on 995, we could have a discussion. But the problem is, is that every single plan that's been issued by DOT places numerous tolling stations all along 84, all many of which are in this area that we're going to have the burden of paying. And I think it's exactly the reason why every single Danbury legislator, many of which are Democrats, in a bipartisan effort, stand against the implementation of tolls because of what it would do to our local businesses and the burden it would place on our local residents here in the state. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. Let's be clear. The roads have to get paid for. So to say that um, it's, it's going to just miraculously get paid for um, if we don't implement something like tolls is really foolhardy. It has to get paid for. So again, I, I maintain that allowing residents from out of state to help to contribute to upholding our infrastructure and taking care of our crumbling roads is the smart thing to do. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. And, and I think it can get paid for uh, within our transportation budget if we stop rating the transportation fund. Um, I think that we can find further efficiencies in our budget to, to pay for the critical projects we have to pay. I think part of it is we have to prioritize. Instead of uh, investing in, in pet projects like a busway from New Britain to Hartford, which I understand the gov Governor Moore supported, uh, it, didn't have, it didn't have a lot of uh, ridership. I think that money would have been better spent fixing the bridges and the, ro the roads that we absolutely have to fix right now. So I think it's, it's, it's part and parcel prioritizing the transportation infrastructure we have here in the state that needs to get fixed now and also just st simply stop rating the transportation fund use the revenue coming in from gas taxes what it's supposed to be used for strictly towards transportation infrastructure what would you do to upgrade candlewood lake mr harding two minutes well i think we, we took a good first step in the in the legislation that i was talking about in my opening statement and that was an opportunity uh, for a steady revenue source to come in uh, to the uh, lakes to allow them to fight invasive species. I think that's one of the biggest issues that we're seeing uh, faced by Lake Sloan owning Candlewood here locally. Um, so I, I, I was proud to support that. I will continue putting in measures to also utilize funds from the Community Investment Act towards lakes. Um, I think that's one of the things that's been bypassed by the Community Investment Act. And I think that we should, uh, the Community Investment Act should use some portion of their funding to go towards a direct revenue stream for lakes because we've received some money and some revenue stream, but it's certainly not enough to address the issues we have to address. In addition to that, from you know, a non-financial standpoint and funding standpoint, I think we also need to be ever present and mindful of the fact that deep and first light are, are there to monitor these lakes. And we have to ensure to create legislation to make it very clear to deep and to first light to enforce the regulations on the lake to ensure public safety. You want to ensure that people are riding their boat safely, that people are enjoying and recreationally swimming and having a good time in a safe manner. And far too often what we've seen is um, deep and first light 
basically shed their obligations to enforce the regulations on the lake and I, I'm going to support legislation if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected uh, that is going to make it abundantly clear to these authorities that they have to enforce the regulations that they've been enacted to enforce. Ms. Colombo, two minutes. We are on the same page in some manner here that uh, we need to protect our environment and the, we only have one environment. So we absolutely need to address the issues um, with, uh, with relation to our lake and making sure, and our lakes, and making sure that, uh, that they're in, you know, in um, good health. But additionally, we've seen that um, the, you know, there was an influx of people using the lake this last year, and that led to a lot of issues with noise ordinances and a lot of litter on the islands, even though they were supposed to be closed because of COVID. We saw a lack of social distancing. We saw boats being tied together. So there were a lot of safety issues, as Mr. Harding rep, um, had re, uh, mentioned there. So part of the problem is that we don't have clear guidelines of whose job is what. So we need to make sure that we are regulating in such a way that everybody knows what their job is so that our, our police know if they are able to go on to the lake and enforce rules and that you know, they don't come to the shore and, and, and decide you know, in certain towns that they're to go no further. So we need to make sure that our collaborative relationship is such that um, there are clearly defined responsibilities. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. Yeah, and just to piggyback what Ms. Columbo was saying, and she's very right, is, 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 is making sure that it's crystal clear to uh, deep, most particularly, what, what, what to enforce. I mean, I, I think what we've seen is Ms. Columbo referenced something that's important is the noise ordinances. We've seen through my discussions with the Canada Lake Authority in regards to a continued increase in violations of noise ordinances this past summer. Um, and the fact that, that deep really didn't quite understand or wasn't willing to enforce some of these noise ordinances because of some ambiguity in the law. I think that's something that should be a bipartisan effort that I would be happy to work on um, in regards to making it crystal clear what these noise ordinances are, uh, make, it, uh, make it crystal clear that, and make it crystal clear that DEEP needs to enforce these regulations. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. Agree. We need to we need to make sure that we have a nice collaborative relationship. We know who's who has what job, what authority, and um, to make sure, first and foremost, that everybody is safe and that our officers can get to people who need them when they need them and if there's a problem. Scott Benjamin, moderator, Brookfield Chamber of Commerce debate between the candidates in the 107th district. A state report in 2018 indicated that. The state pensions are only 29% funded. What steps would you take to address that? Ms. Colombo, two minutes. Yeah, as mentioned earlier, um, you know, I, I've been very impressed with the work that's been done with our, our governor and our treasurer and the investments that have been made um, because we are, we have seen now a 15% budget surplus and that is going to be used to help to fund our, um, our pension debt to ensure that those who have earned their pensions are going to receive those pensions when they need it. So we need to continue on that path and ensure that we are being very responsible in an economic way so that we are, being, we are able to fund in the future. Mr. Harding, two minutes. So uh, Ms. Clum was right. I think a lot of this comes down to ensuring that the individuals that have been promised these pensions are gonna have a sustainable pension fund to, to pay them when, when they come to retirement and deserve their benefit that they, they earned. Um, but I, I do think one thing we need to do, and, and what we've seen in Hartford um, even recently, uh, is uh, entering into collectively bargain agreements uh, with new state employees and still providing the same pension plans. I mean, there, there have been some modifications in terms of a hybrid, but for the most part, we're still offering uh, pension systems here in the state to new employees. Uh, you know, the, the current employees, we've made those contractual obligations to them. We need to pay them. Uh, but I, I don't see any issue with telling a new employee on day one, we, we're not gonna be able to afford offering the same pension plan that we've offered in the past. Ma moving to maybe a, 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 a defined uh, contribution plan as, defined, as opposed to a defined benefit plan, I think could, find, could lead to significant savings going forward and also provide a retirement for new employees that uh, are retiring into the future. And I think, so I think like my, many issues we're facing in the state, I think the first step we're gonna, we need to take is to solve the problem that we have and continue obligating ourselves in debt obligations that we simply can't afford and telling new employees on day one that we're offering a different pension plan than we've, we've offered in the past to start saving money and finding efficiencies in our budget to pay the obligations that we have now. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. I do agree that we have to move forward in such a way that we're careful about um, 
you know, what is offered. But at the same time, I'm also very concerned about particularly our teachers. And, um, you know, our teachers are not paid tremendously well. And, you know, they do such um, an enormous job for our community. Education is the background of society, in my opinion. And, you know, I believe that we need to teach, uh, to uh, treat our teachers with respect and ensure that they're taken care of. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. As a, uh, a husband to a public school teacher, I completely agree. Um, and, and that's the reason why we have separately, separately bargained units. You know, I think that we can, we can work with different units and negotiate different plans with different units, and that's the reason why each bargaining unit uh, is separate. Um, and so we can have discussions about teachers, we can have discussions about state police, we can have discussions about uh, other state workers like DOT workers and such, attorney generals, uh, things like that. We can have separate collectively bargain agreements with separate unions in the state. And, and, and again, I, I think that we need to find efficiencies while also providing a, a strong benefit uh, in retirement to these employees. Do you agree with Governor Lamont's decision on the reopening of schools K through 12 during the fall? Mr. Harding, two minutes. I, I do agree with uh, what the governor has done. I think what was smart about the plan was that we, it was a community-based plan. Every community uh, may have different needs. Every community may have, unfortunately, different levels of COVID. Uh, as we've seen in Danbury, for example, unfortunately, we've seen a spike, and that has, I think, kept Danbury Public Schools to be on an entirely virtual basis, uh, whereas other communities uh, throughout the area um, have fortunately uh, not seen a spike and been able to move towards uh, entire in-person learning. Uh, and what I, what I appreciate with what the local board, boards of education have done in collaboration with the town, in collaboration with the PTO and the parents and the students and the faculty is they've crafted plans for each individual school district that I think is in the best interest in, in the community as a whole. And they've also provided uh, options to uh, students and to parents for those that may not be comfortable going into school for obvious reasons to, to be able to learn virtually um, and provide that option to students and parents who may choose to do that. So again, I, I do support the plan to make it a, a community-based decision in regards to reopening our schools. Um, and I think, again, oftentimes we find that when decisions are made at the local level, oftentimes they're the right decisions for the local community. Ms. Colombo, two minutes. I do think we've done overall a good job considering we've never experienced a pandemic before and that the governor has done a good job. Um, I think, you know, as Mr. Harding said, that each community is a little bit different and has different needs. Um, and those can be addressed somewhat differently. Um, you know, certainly I think that we could certainly have benefited from more federal funding to help with um, the different safety measures that we need in the schools. You know, it, we're, we still have concerns about ventilation in, in the older buildings and that sort of thing um, that we just want to make sure that everybody is addressed across the board. And our school systems have done a good job in the 107th, so that is a really good thing. So, Mr. Um, Harding, 60 seconds. And yeah, just, uh, just to, to, to uh, say I agree, uh, I think, uh, I, and I want to thank the Board of Education. I think I would join Ms. Colombo in saying this together, that you know, the Board of Education have worked tirelessly to make these plans. Uh, the school administration, the teachers, uh, you know, God bless their efforts during this very, very difficult time. Learning in these types of environments is extremely difficult and being able to provide strong educational opportunities to our local students. Uh, what we've seen is a collaboration of a lot of individuals coming together in the best interest of our community. And I want to, I think I join both of us in saying we want to thank all of them. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. Absolutely. They, they've done a terrific job. Um, you know, our, our superintendents and our Board of Education um, folks and, and the teachers um, have all worked in a really nice and collaborative way, and that has been the benefit to our children. Absolutely. What would you do to address affordable housing in the legislative district? Ms. Colombo, two minutes. Yeah, I think affordable housing is critical um, for our communities. Um, housing is simply too expensive in Connecticut. It has been known time and time again. And um, the fact is that we need housing for many different sectors of our population. We need housing for our seniors to age in place, our service workers to live where they work, our disabled folks to have access to public transportation, single parents, young families. 
Um, and although I know that my opponent has said before that he believes our, our towns will just graciously address housing needs on their own, unfortunately, the fact is that our towns have historically uh, changed their zoning laws to ensure that we can't have affordable housing and to ensure that only single family ho homes would be in our suburban communities. So unfortunately, the state did have to step in and implement rules um, to force us to, um, to implement affordable housing so that we could address um, these issues and have spaces you know, in our community for young families who are starting out or for youth to return home and live and for folks to come from cities who are looking for better opportunities and a good education. And that really is critical that, um, that we have affordable housing available in our communities. Mr. Harding, two minutes. Well, and I think our town has, has done, you know, despite the fact we have a moratorium, which means that you know, developers cannot bring in 8-30G applications at this time. Despite that, we have still built affordable housing in this community so that this town ha has taken an effort uh, on its own volition uh, to work with our local zoning boards and build uh, affordable housing in conjunction with our zoning laws, which is ultimately what, what we all should want. Um, I, I do not support the effort that we've seen in the state to move to a statewide zoning model. I think that, that towns should have some say in regards to what gets built in the community within reasonability. And, uh, you know, frankly, you know, what, what frustrates me about 8-30G is that it is, uh, it is a, simply a law that allows developers to completely usurp the zoning system under the guise of affordable housing, which I just think is wrong. Um, and and we, we, we go back to what happened at 777 Federal Road and the fact that we had a developer come in and propose a six-story building and we didn't even have ladders in our fire department for our volunteers to reach the, the top floor of that building. Um, any law that promotes this type of development, uh, frankly, I don't think is, is, is a positive law and we need to look towards other areas to address affordable housing as opposed to a law that simply just allows, again, greedy developers to come in and completely usurp the zoning system in our state. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. To be clear, as long as we are offering affordable housing, developers can't come in and usurp our zoning laws. So as long as we're in compliance with that, as Mr. Dunn worked very hard to do by negotiating down that six-story building in the Four Corners District down to a three-story building a few years back and getting that moratorium, um, that al has allowed us to continue to add that affordable housing to ensure that we have homes available for folks and not be um, imposed upon by builders to the detriment of our community. So we can continue to address these needs and do it by our own rules where we want them, where we want affordable housing. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. Yeah, and I understand what Ms. Colombo is saying. I, just, I, I don't know if I would completely agree with that point. I think that what we've seen is, is Bethel is currently not in a moratorium uh, and they're under the auspices right now of 8-30G and have seen uh, projects that, again, completely usurp zoning laws. Uh, in their area, and Bethel has made a concentrated effort under Mr. Knickerbocker's lead uh, to, to develop affordable housing, quite a, quite a lot of affordable housing in the area. And so they are developing, they're doing the right thing, uh, and, and despite all that, they're still under the auspices of 830G and, and have to deal with uh, applications that don't comply at all with zoning laws. Do you have a position on the proposed charter school in Danbury, Mr. Harding? Two minutes. I think that we need to explore a number of options. You know, I, I do agree that, that uh, you know, the public schools in our state need to properly be funded, and that needs to be our first priority, absolutely. Um, uh, but I also, I also agree that, that uh, we, there is an, certainly an issue in Danbury with over, overcrowding of the schools and providing students good educational opportunities with uh, more limited classroom sizes than they currently have now. I think my understanding is that they have to uh, segment the shifts in which the students are let out of classes at Danbury High School because th there's such a bottleneck in the hallways because the school is so overpopulated. So I think at least for an immediate need to, to be able to address a new school in, in the district to allow students the opportunity um, to, to, to attend uh, another school um, can be explored. I mean, again, I think that public schools need to be our first priority, but uh, I think we need to explore a holistic uh, approach to to addressing the overcrowding in schools we're seeing in Danbury. Mr. Ms. Colombo, two minutes. I believe that our tax money should be going toward our public schools. You know, um, I, you know, if we're having an overcrowding situation rather than build a charter school, why are we not addressing the issues in our public school? You know, that's where I think our tax money should be going, um, funding our public schools. 
Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. And, and I agree. I think that the, the first approach needs to be to our public schools. But I think it, at least in the immediacy, if there is an opportunity to provide an immediate alternative to some students to address some of the overcrowding uh, with the charter school, that might be an option that, that can be explored. Uh, I agree ultimately that we need to fund the public schools uh, um, in, in, in a better manner to address this issue first and foremost. But at least in the immediacy, if there's an opportunity to address the overcrowding with the charter school, I think it, it, it warrants at least uh, uh, to, to look into it, to implore it a little bit, explore it a little bit. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. Well, in, I think in that same amount of time, we can explore fixing the problem where it is, which is in the public school system and making sure that our funds, again, are going to our public schools and, um, and creating more opportunities so that kids are not so overcrowded in the Danbury school system, which has been an ongoing problem for years. What would you do or what should the state do to address the opiate crisis? Ms. Colombo, two minutes. Yeah, this, is, this has been a real issue and, um, and it does need to be addressed and we need to make sure that uh, we're doing enough education for our youth and even the adults that are suffering with opioid addiction. Um, and we also need to ensure that, um, that we're, I think, better regulating the prescriptions that are being written in such a way so that people can't acquire the opioids um, to begin with and, and uh, develop such issues. Um, and you know, perhaps alternative types of medications so that folks don't have to take opioids in the first place. Mr. Harding, two minutes. To Ms. Columbus' point, I think that the, the first step is, and, and unfortunately what we've seen, uh, one of the reasons why we've seen so, such a significant rise is prescription drugs. Individuals, innocently enough, being provided some pain, pain medication to address either a surgery or some pain they're dealing with. And then unfortunately, because of how powerful these medications are uh, and, and, and how flexible these, some of these doctors are in prescribing these medications, um, we've seen individuals unfortunately become addicted and it, it is such a terrible thing. I, I've, I, I, I've lost friends to, to this epidemic. I, I'm, I'm sure Ms. Colombo has lost family and friends unfortunately to this epidemic. We, we all have know people that have unfortunately lost their lives to this terrible, terrible disease that we face. And I think the first address, thing we need to address here is, um, the first thing we need to address here is, 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 is removing the stigma that's involved. Um, it is a disease. It is a disease. It, 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 just like any other medical illness, individuals that, that, that are, are unfortunate to be dealing with this terrible disease uh, need, need to be encouraged to seek help and need to be uh, cared for. Um, and and uh, we need to be by their side and helping them address uh, whatever issues they're facing. I think we need to crack down harder, I agree, on the medical doctors that are prescribing it. And I think the other thing that you know, I was frustrated by was that you know, we, we've passed legislation recently that limited uh, you know, officers' ability to search vehicles in regards to narcotics coming in to the state. I mean, we also need to address the fact that we have narcotics coming into the state that individuals are getting addicted on, and we need to do everything we can to address it and stop it from coming in. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. We do need to um, ensure that people have access to the health care that they need. Mental health care is under addressed in our society. And as mentioned, um, you know, there is a stigma that often goes along with that, which is um, unfortunately unfortunate. Um, but so we need to address health care, number one. And as far as the, the consent search, searches that you just mentioned, that has st statistically been proven as a primary tool for racial profiling. So I understand completely why that was part of the recent police reform bill. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. It so I, I understand and I respect that, and, 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 and so I do believe it needs to be addressed, but at the same time, I think we do need to provide police officers the ability in, in, in certain individuals where there may be illegal guns in the car, illegal weapons, or narcotics coming in to, to address that issue and to eliminate uh, their ability to properly search these vehicles, I think is, very, is a very dangerous precedent. Next question, do you support the state police reform bill that was recently approved? Mr. Harding, two minutes. Uh, I, I, I did oppose the bill, and, and I think uh, every good police officer in the world, many of which I spoke with here locally, will tell you that we do need to have reform in this state. It's absolutely necessary, and we do need to have better training. Um, but unfortunately, I think this bill went beyond uh, just simply reform and training and, and really started addressing uh, not only uh, police officers being inhibited from protecting themselves, 
but also inhibited police officers from protecting the community in general. Um, I, we, we talked about the consent searches, and we have a disagreement on that, and I think that uh, you know, narcotics and, and dressing illegal guns coming into this state is something that we need to address, and allowing police officers the ability uh, to search vehicles that may, be, uh, may have those vehicles and they have pr reasonable suspicion to believe that those vehicles have those weapons or narcotics. Uh, the police officers should have the ability to, to search those vehicles and to address those issues from coming into any community throughout the state. Um, I think in addition to that, uh, there's also measures that were put in place that restrict an officer's ability to use force in instances where victims are, are being victimized and, 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 and could be in danger. Um, and so I, I can't support efforts to inhibit a police officer's ability to protect society in general. And, and some, those are some areas of the bill that, that, I, that I was opposed to. Ms. Colombo, two minutes. We're definitely on a different page on this one. Um, so the police reform bill, there's been a lot of misinformation that's been going around. We're very fortunate in Brookfield and Bethel, we have great police departments here, but that's not the case throughout the state. And so what we've done with this police reform bill is to ensure a fair and balanced bill that addresses issues that we've been seeing across the country and in other parts of the state. So, you know, as, as Mr. Harding said, he opposed the police reform bill, and that's opposing holding police accountable for breaking the law. We have a lot of good police officers. We don't need police officers breaking law. So um, additionally, by opposing that, that um, police reform bill that's that was opposing $4 million in funding for our police departments for them to pay for body cams and, and cams in their cars um, that I know here in Brookfield, they were already on order anyway, even before this bill came to light. Um, there's also this change in the force standard. Uh, you know, I, I don't see how anybody can, can see a man die beneath the knee of a police officer and not believe that our change of force standard has to be changed. Um, and what this bill does is stop inappropriate force. It does not prohibit a cop from doing their job. It, it does not prohibit them from um, protecting themselves or the community in any way. What it does do is protect the average citizen from being victimized from uh, police officers who, um, who are not abiding by the law. Mr. Harding, 60 seconds. Yeah, first, you know, in regards to Mr. Floyd's murder in Minnesota and, and other tragic events, that is just wholly unacceptable. Um, and there are provisions of the bill that are positive, that are good, that I would agree with, um, that I do agree with. Uh, but there are aspects of the bill that, again, I, which I just mentioned, um, I, I feel are uh, inhibiting the safety of the individuals throughout the community uh, and throughout the state. Um, in regards to funding, one of the programs that was eliminated through this bill was the 1003 program, which allowed police officers to assess weapons like uh, certain weapons to, to address school shootings and, and terrible events like that. And so th there are costs to police officers that I understand there's some funding in the bill, but there's also costs to the police officers as well in regards to some, some of the, uh, the, the, um, the aids or supplies they may need to address tragic situations that may, God forbid, ever occur in any community throughout the state. Ms. Colombo, 60 seconds. Fortunately, part of this bill also allows for more police training, which police themselves acknowledge that um, is helpful, certainly. And uh, another piece of this bill um, creates, uh, you know, um, a ban on quotas for pedestrian stops and such so that police are not feeling like their hands are tied, that they have to hit certain numbers on a regular basis. And that helps everybody. It helps relationship in the community between police and the average citizen. Closing statements, Mr. Harding, three minutes. Let's move my, to my closing pages page. I apologize for being a second. So, uh, first off, I just want to take a moment again. I think this is a really great discussion. Um, I think uh, that uh, many of the viewers at home um, uh, really provide an opportunity to hear from us on the issues. Again, I want to thank Kerry for uh, running uh, such a, a positive, good campaign and for coming this evening. I want to thank Scott. Um, I want to thank, again, the Chamber of Commerce for providing us this great opportunity. We're really in a critical juncture here in our, in our state. Um, you know, really, we can go one or two ways when it comes down to addressing the financial issues we have here. As we addressed earlier tonight, uh, we have a $5 billion deficit that we have to address. And um, we really can go down the way that we've gone for the past 30 years plus here in the state and, and try to tax our way out of every deficit that we have. 
or we can go and look within ourselves, within our state government, within our bureaucracy, and find the efficiencies that we need uh, to provide a, a more efficient government for the people of the state, and also at the same time to reduce and alleviate the tax burden placed upon all the individuals throughout the state. And that th those are policies in which I will be supporting uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected uh, to another term uh, up in Hartford. And I think those, those issues are critically, critically important as many businesses are beginning to reopen. In addition to that, I think one of the issues that we absolutely have to address, we didn't have an opportunity to speak about it tonight, is Eversource and the utilities. Um, they, are, um, they have performed so poorly throughout the, the storms that we've had. Um, and we took a good step in the special session that we had in addressing some of those issues. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. We need to take a holistic approach to addressing the utilities throughout our state. And, and really, nothing can be thrown away. We need to discuss all the ways in which we may be able to significantly change the utility system in the state. The people of this state in regards to utilities need to be provided better services, better restoration times, and even more importantly, more affordable rates than what they're currently paying. In addition to that, I will always fight for education for this district, uh, despite the fact that in the majority in the legislature and multiple governors have proposed completely eliminating funding to towns like Brookfield and Bethel. I will always oppose that, those efforts and always put the interest of our local students ahead of anywhere else, because that, that is a job, I believe, as state representative. As I said before, my life has changed a lot over the past five years, uh, being married, uh, being the father of a growing family, uh, being a solo practicing attorney, um, and it's given me even more of a passion for the job than I'm fortunate enough to have. I am proud to fight for our community, and I think I am proud of my record fighting for this community and always putting our community first. I am proud to be, have been raised here and be a product of this community, and I'm proud now to be raising my, my own family here. These are the reasons why I always put us first, this community first, and I will never apologize for that. I believe in this community, and I humbly ask for your opportunity to believe in me for another two years to represent you in Hartford. Thank you. Ms. Colombo, three minutes. Thank you again to everyone tonight. And as your state representative, I pledge that I will fight for and vote for our present and our future. My opponent often says that he's bipartisan and that he works for everyone in our district, but the fact is that voting party line 97% of the time is not bipartisan. That's an A plus on the Trump scale. <laughs> we want a leader in Hartford, someone who's gonna challenge party norms and fight for the people of the 107th. My opponent voted against legislation that our residents want, against funding for our schools in Brookfield and Bethel to the tune of $732,000, voting against the budget, against holding police accountable for breaking the law. He voted against paid family medical leave that is a safety net for families. He voted against the $15 an hour minimum wage when families are struggling to get by. And he voted against teacher protections in allowing union access to teachers. He's out of alignment with the needs of our community. Instead, he's aligned himself with a party that now listens, or that they lie to their citizens, they disavow science, they've thrown our country into chaos and has made a, have made us more vulnerable than we ever have been in modern history. And of course, now with the Supreme Court nominee hanging in the balance, the rights of our residents are under threat. The stakes have never been higher in Connecticut at the state level. I am a fierce advocate for my community, for equity, and for the future of our country. My background is uniquely suited to this position. I've lived in both Bethel and Brookfield, in cities and in suburbs. I've worked in big corporations and small businesses and nonprofit organizations. I've served in healthcare with seniors and the disabled. I've owned my own business and I've been a working mom. I'm a passionate believer in fighting for things to make the world a better place. If you want a state representative and a legislature that believes in heeding the advice of scientists and health experts, a fair living wage, affordable access to health care and medicine and housing, <clears throat> greater educational opportunities, holding people accountable when they break the law, a responsible approach to fixing our infrastructure and taking care of our environment, creating equity and opportunity, and planning for the future while addressing the needs of today in a fiscally responsible and efficient way, it's my intention to uphold these things. I'm a passionate believer that we are called to make the world a better place than we found it. And I'll bring that passion to Hartford and fight for effective, positive change on the legislative level. And as your representative, I will fight to protect us and to help build a better future for all of us. 
Thanks to the candidates, the Brookfield Municipal Government and its Information Technology Department and the Brookfield Chamber of Commerce, please be sure to vote November 3rd. I'm Scott Benjamin. Thanks for joining us.